All right, we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another session with the Sakota crew. Today, you have myself and Brittany with us. Brittany, how's it going? It's good. I'm uh, I'm usually the one hosting and not really yeah. having to think about anything, but we're <laughs> switching seats today, and I'm a we're little nervous. Ah, uh, no, you're gonna. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. We're here to talk today about integrations and unlocking your data's full potential with unlimited connections. So before we get into it, um, maybe Brett, we can do a quick round of introductions for folks who haven't attended a Sakota webinar and haven't seen our faces before. Um, I'm Lindsay Murphy. I'm the head of data at Sakota. I do a lot of these webinars, as does Brittany. Um, my, my role is uh, I've been in data for many years. Um, I do, I build our internal infrastructure at Sakota, but I also get to do fun things like this and get out in the community and engage with folks. And Brittany, I'll hand it over to you. Yeah, thanks so much. My name is Brittany. I'm a solutions engineer here at Sakota. Uh, I've been here uh, long enough to really learn to love this data community and all the things that everyone does to make sure people are learning and growing together. And part of that are these webinars. So I'm really excited to uh, be able to share knowledge and show how folks can use Sakota in unique ways and make the most of this tool for your data stack. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Well, we actually have a slide deck today. We usually don't have a slide deck. We usually have, so we have, um, we have some slides that we were going to go through really quickly and then Britt's going to take things over and do an actual hands-on workshop. So we are going to see some coding today. It's going to be very exciting. So without further ado, I will kick us off with uh, some slides here. All right. I have to do the question. Can you see my screen? <laughs> yeah, good to go. Okay. All right. So for folks uh, who are not as familiar with Sakota, I thought what we could do first is just kick things off by talking a little bit about Sakota. So Sakota stands for searchable company data, and we connect into all the tools in your modern data stack to enable data consumers and data producers and the data team to be able to get access to metadata information about your entire stack and be able to see things like end-to-end -end lineage, catalog all the information, document, uh, run through governance. And more recently, we've added uh, more data quality tools, things like monitoring, and we're working on, on lots more to focus on data quality coming very soon. So Sakota is a really useful tool for data teams to get kind of a bird's eye view of their whole data stack and make that information actionable and available to everyone else in the company. And to be able to do that, the most powerful part, probably one of the most powerful things about Skoda is really the integration piece. So being able to connect to all the different tools that you have in your tech stack. Uh, there's lots of them out there, as we know. There's like, I think the the most recent um, MAD art landscape that has all of the, the logos on it has something like 2000 logos on it this year. Uh, so there's always more tools coming out in the data stack and Sakota integrates with a, a lot of them. And that is really the power of these of the tool like Sakota is that it gives you visibility into your whole tech stack. But as we know, the data space is always kind of changing and there's always more data tools coming out. And really data stacks are kind of unique. They're very unique to different companies. Every company that I have worked for has had a very different data stack. Every customer that we have at Sakota has a very unique data stack to them. And so this is where the custom integration piece comes in, is that not only are data stacks unique, but data sources are unique. And so in a lot of ways, you may have data sources that, you know, don't necessarily fit into a native integration that Sakota has already built for you. And so to be able to make sure that you can still get all the great benefits of using a tool like Sakota, Sakota has made it available to, uh, that you can create your own custom integrations. And that is what we're going to talk about today. How can you do that? How can you uh, get that information into Sakota and then be able to get all of the wonderful benefits that we have with all of our other data sources? And when you've created a custom integration, something else that you can do is share it with the community. And so a lot of times this is a pretty common practice in a lot of different tools out there. When you've created something, you know, DBT packages, other things like that, you can actually, similarly to that, you can share your work. So if you've created something that you think would be useful for others to use, uh, and it's working well, you can submit it for review with Sakota and we can publish it in our marketplace so that others can get use from it and you can give back to the community, which is always uh, a really nice way that you can engage with other data folks. Okay, I went through that really quickly. I'm actually gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna hand things over to Brittany because Brittany is now gonna take us through an example use case and then we'll kick off into the workshop. 
All right. Well, I'm also going to share my screen. So we're going to hope that this all works. And I'm going to be bouncing between slides, uh, Visual Studio Code, and Sakota. So I'm probably just going to end up sharing my entire screen. And we're just going to hope for the best here. Um, sharing screens, you know, however long it's been of online everything, it still always feels a little nerve wracking uh, to share your screen. So uh, how do I do this? Present? There we go. Okay. I think everyone can see my screen. I'm seeing, I'm seeing it. So hopefully you're seeing it. Cool. Uh, so thank you, Lindsay, for teeing us up there. And, and like Lindsay mentioned, you know, everyone has a unique data stack and whether it's, you know, legacy data, whether it's just a low tech solution to something, uh, data science, CSVs that you're using, external sources, there's many different reasons uh, why you might need a custom integration. And even beyond that, it could just be that you have a tool that we don't support yet and you don't wanna wait for us to build it. And while we're constantly putting out new integrations, we love being able to work with our customers to really get to a place of capturing and documenting their entire data stack, right? That's what really, like Lindsay said, that's what really makes Sakota as great as it can be is making sure you have your entire uh, data stack from start to finish in in the tool so that's discoverable so that you can see lineage so that you can ask it questions you know with our AI um, that's really the goal that we want to make sure our customers are getting to so how do we do this well let me give you an example scenario uh, let's pretend that I run an e-commerce brand and primarily all of my sales are done online so I can really just figure out exactly where all the sales data is coming from. If I have a nice, you know, sales dashboard, um, a visualization and some sort of BI tool, I know exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from my Shopify or wherever else I'm hosting um, my e-commerce. And I'm probably not using the right terminology. I've never run an e-commerce brand, but we can just pretend. Uh, one summer I decide, you know what, things are going really well and I want to expand this. And so I decide to do, do a pop-up, but my pop-ups are low tech, low, like not a lot of funding for the pop-ups. I just want to kind of get myself out there, get my, a few of my team members out there and see what we can do. And so what ends up happening is I'm using CSVs to collect sales data, but I need that information to still go into my final reports, right? When I'm talking to investors or when I'm trying to pitch for more money, whatever it might be, um, I need that information to all be amalgamated. And so when I look at the end goal, when I look at my uh, dashboard, I want to know where all this, where all the information is coming from, where all my sales data is coming from. But here's my issue. My sales data from the pop-ups, they're coming from CSVs. These CSVs are in Google Cloud uh, storage. They're in buckets. There really isn't a great integration for this as it stands because Google Cloud is notoriously unopinionated, right? You can kind of just throw anything in there um, and it will organize itself. And you, you get a lot of option on what everything in here means, which is great when you're just trying to put things in storage, but not so great when you're trying to catalog or standardize them. So here's my situation here. I have this data. Um, it doesn't really do much for me other than just exist. And so I want to get this into Sakota. A side note that we will tackle uh, that I will show at the end is that I did load this data into B BigQuery as well. But even when you load it into BigQuery, unless you're using um, some sort of lineage tool or transformation tool, BigQuery doesn't show you that it came from a CSV. It essentially just copy and paste what's in your CSV into a table, loads that, and there you have it. And that is usually not enough, right? You want to know where this information is coming from all the way back to the source in the same way that, you know, in my day to day, when I want to know where uh, customer insights are coming from, I can see that it's come all the way from our database in our interaction with customers through our tool. So being able to see it all the way to where that data was collected is really important. And so you can't do that unless you actually have all of the sources amalgamated into one product, which is our product. And we're really proud of this. So how do we get this into Sakota? It's on the bottom left there. What, what do we need to do? 
Well, we can build a custom integration. One thing we'll touch on on the end is there's a few different ways to build a custom integration in Sakota, but the one that we are most excited about and we really hope folks use and also can be used to uh, bring back to the community by sharing in the marketplace is our SDK, our Sakota DK, if you will, Sakota Development Kit. Uh, it is a more technical solution. It does require some coding and planning. Um, we do have less technical solutions for folks who want to try that out, and I'll touch on that briefly. It's also all in our documentation. But for this presentation, we will be focusing on this webinar. We will be focusing on the SDK and just some of the ways that you can implement it to see your resources within Sakota. And like I mentioned already, all of this is documented. It's in our Sakota doc. So if you are interested in learning more, there's a lot of places to do so. We'll share that at the end. All right. So I am building a custom integration in Sakota. What do I need to do before I even begin? There's a few steps that we want to do. We want to first map your architecture. Now, these are exercises I go through with our customers. So if you're a customer that's watching this and you know that we've chatted about this before, you might have not seen this screen, but you've definitely heard me talk about this. Uh, but if it's something that you're considering and you want to reach out to us, you'll probably get a screen like this when we start planning it out. So Sakota tends to fall under two different types of architectures in the way that we organize our resources, either a table or a dashboard or visualization tool architecture. Now, it doesn't mean that the integration that you're connecting has to be a table type tool or a visualization type tool, but you do have to figure out how it will map to our existing resource types. So in Sakota, we have an integration that's the highest level. Then we get into a database, schema, table, column, going down in, uh, in the family lineage. And as with uh, you know any type of integration that we might have, we have the ability to do a one-to-many relationship. So one integration can have many databases. Each database can have many schemas. Schemas will have many tables, columns. Uh, tables will have many columns. And we even offer nested columns as well, if that's something that your integration requires. So for my Google Cloud Storage bucket, how do I want to map it? Well, if we look back, we can see that I have a bucket. It's called Pop-Up Sales Data Canada. In that bucket, I have a top folder called 2023. Uh, then I have three subfolders, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver. And it's within these subfolders that I have the CSV that actually contains the sales data. In the CSV, there are headers, which are essentially columns. So there's data in there as well. And so when I'm thinking about how I can map it, what comes to mind for me is that the bucket will be the integration. So I'm not just going to uh, integrate at this stage my entire Google Cloud storage. I'm specifically focused on that one bucket um, for this stage. Obviously, that might change. Other people might have different requirements. But as it stands right now, that's what we're focused on. The database will be that top folder, that 2023 folder. That's how I'll be mapping this out. Uh, the schemas will be the location specific schemas. So uh, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver. The table will map directly to the CSV file and the columns will be headers in the CSV. So mapping this out allows me to be very clear about what resources that I'll be declaring using the Sakota DK, the SDK. Um, for what it's worth, I do know that SDKs generally stand for software development kit, but how, how can you give up an opportunity to throw your own uh, your own brand in there? So Sakota DK, it shall stand. Uh, but once we've mapped this out, it'll make it a lot easier for me to then go in and actually write the code. Now, what's our next step? Sakota doesn't just grab your resources. We allow you to get your resources to flourish. And how do they flourish? Well, through documentation and metadata. Uh, Sakota has many different metadata options. Uh, if you go through our documentation, you can see just what we bring in from all of our sources. But also, all of these things are editable in the UI through our APIs, um, using our AI descriptions. There's just a lot that you can do to really bring context to your data. And so these are just some of the things that we uh, offer that can really allow for that extra context that meet around your data. So titles, descriptions, documentation, PII, custom tags, verified tags, owners. Uh, in Sakota, we have a several different types. Uh, so we have an entity type, which maps to what we're seeing here, the database, the schema, the table, the column. This is really under the hood stuff, but it's helpful to know when you're getting into our software, sorry, Sakota development kit. 
Uh, the native type, that's the type that you refer to your uh, resource as. So for instance, in this situation, the table is actually a CSV file. So while the architecture to mapping is going to be a table, the native type of what I want to show up in the UI, what I want my end users to see is that it's a CSV file. When they see the type of this resource, it's a CSV file. Um, and then things like updated at, created at, all of that fun stuff is available for you. Now on my Google storage, what metadata do I have? I haven't gone too deep into all of the different uh, options there of what's available, but just briefly, I know that usually on, on these blobs as Google Cloud calls it, you can get a title, you can figure out your owners, tags, type updated at, and realistically, you can then map all of this metadata on extraction instead of having to do it in Sakota to Sakota. Um, but then if you don't like what you've originally maintained in Google Cloud, you can then maintain the source of truth in Sakota and add your owners and add your tags and do all those other things that really help with that data quality and data governance, which I think are terms that's on everyone's mind, uh, especially ours. All right, so now that we've chosen our metadata, we're gonna determine the authentication method. Uh, so what we've got here is a very typical screenshot of the form that our users will use to authenticate their integration. Uh, when you are adding your own integration, you essentially get to create this form. And we'll show you how it's not, we make it as easy as, it, as we can. Uh, but you want to determine what authentication, what credentials the end user will need if they're setting this up, or what credentials you'll need if you're setting this up um, that you can submit through a form. And that form will then be used in your code, and I'll show you how that happens. But it's it's no different than any other integration. The really cool thing about the SDK is that once you've written your code, we actually allow you to upload it to Sakota. And like Lindsay said, you can share it with the community. But what uploading it means is that you can have your connection in, you can have your connection details in a form. You can run your um, integration on a schedule. You don't have to put anything on your own pipelines. Uh, and it really gives you a lot of flexibility in how you want to use this code and bring in those resources and just generally a lot of um, standardization around integrations. I, I love a good pattern and the connection details are one of those great patterns that we make it a lot easier for you to do to bring in your resources. All right. The other thing that we've tried to make a lot easier for our users is uh, declaring lineage. So at, with our SDK, our Sakota DK, you do get to not just declare resources, but also add lineage. Uh, and the way that we're doing that right now is by offering four different models of lineage uh, an internal resource, external table, external column, and tables from SQL query. And I'll get into it a little bit more with the code so you can see this in real time. But essentially what this means is that you can declare lineage within your integration. So all those resources that you just, what are they? All those resources, there we go, that you just declared, you can declare lineage within them if that's something that you would like to do. But you can also declare lineage between them and external tables or columns that already exist within the infrastructure. So already exists within Sakota, and maybe a little bit of a, of a what's it called when they tell you the uh, a precursor when you when you get a little bit of the book before you get there. I'm forgetting my words, um, but we're uh, foreshadowing. That's what we're looking for, foreshadowing. But remember earlier when I had mentioned that we'd already loaded the CSVs in BigQuery, um, and so maybe some lineage to an external table would prove to be quite useful for us because BigQuery is already in our Sakota workspace. Uh, our tables from SQL query is a really fun one. We will uh, resolve the query and whatever is the result of that. If we find it within Sakota, i.e. if you've integrated with Sakota, that lineage piece will be created. So it just gives you a lot of flexibility in how you determine and declare your lineage patterns and your lineage resources. All right, so that was a lot of talking, but just as a high level, we reviewed what is your architecture, what is the metadata, what is the authentication, and what is the lineage. And with those four pieces of information planned out, you can now go and actually start coding. So now comes the hard part of switching my screen. Um, actually, ah, perfect. I made it easy for myself. Uh, and Lindsay and I, as we were planning for this, we, we talked a lot about a cooking show, you know, how much do you want to do live versus 
um, how much uh, how much is pre-baked. And you know what? I just did not trust myself to do this live. So a lot of this is pre-baked. Um, however, I will take us through all of the code and uh, all of this will be available as a recording afterwards. We might even add this code uh, directly to a example in our docs. So if you're overwhelmed, if all of this is feeling like a lot, don't stress. We'll go through it and there'll be plenty of opportunities to learn it again later on. Okay. So now that we understand all of our things that we need to know in preparation to code, we can start to code. The first thing you want to do is actually import the Sakota DK, which we see right here. It is its official name, Sakota DK. Um, and so there's a line here where this is, these are all the different uh, models that I'm using from the Sakota DK. So the Sakota integration, the resource lineage, all that fun stuff is all there. Uh, and then I have a few other, you know, imports that I generally wanted. Um, the ones you'll need for sure are OS because we use that to grab the credentials from that form, the authentication form. Um, and then the other ones are more optional. Um, generally, if you are bringing in an external library into your uh, SDK code and you want to upload it into Sakota, um, please let us know as we do need to go through some approvals to make sure that they will work. Um, but a good mess, a quick message to us and, you know, uh, give us a little bit of time and we should be able to do it. I did this myself in order to get Google cloud on our, uh, allow list for the SDK. And that made my life of authenticating way easier. Um, otherwise it just would have been a bit of a nightmare. So I'm glad that I got that <laughs> approved, but if you have others you want approved, please just let us know and we'll work through that situation together. Um, let me actually zoom in on this a little bit. So it's a little easier to see. So the Sakota DK is an extension of um, the Sakota integration. And a, what we expect is an implementation of a method called extract. So all of your resource declarations and your lineage declarations need to happen within this method of extract. And as you can see, we have an extension of a class here. So Sakota integration, but we're making it our own. And so this is the Google Cloud Storage mm -hmm. integration. Now, before I even get into that, I'm going to scroll to the bottom and show you how we are creating our authentication. So authentication happens here. Uh, essentially, we want to create a dictionary uh, called credentials. And this is, again, all in the documentation. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to set up two keys and the value of what you're grabbing from that form. So this directly maps to the form and we'll see how to set up the form um, after we've gone through the code. But this directly maps to the form and we're pulling, we're saying essentially for anyone who's not super familiar with these terms, we're saying find the form input for JSON file and assign it to JSON credentials.json file. Same thing here, find the form input for bucket name, credentials are uh, then the bucket name will be credentials.bucket name. So we can then use this to actually authenticate and work through our code. If there are any other variables that are required um, for your code, feel free to put them here as well. Any, any type of user input that's required, if there's an email or a username, whatever it might be, um, that should all go here. This is a, just an open dictionary for our end a coder to use. All right, so we can imagine that we've inputted our credentials. We can go back up here. The very first thing I'm doing here is I'm getting authenticated. So this is loading, you know, my JSON key. It's taking it from that input. It's making it work with the uh, Google Cloud Storage authentication, which I'm not going to get into all of the underpinnings of that. It is a advanced technology that my brain did not want to to want, want to learn. Uh, but the other thing I'm doing is because I'm saying the integration isn't just going to grab all the buckets, my goal is to be very particular about which bucket I'm bringing in because I'm opinionated about that bucket. I've chosen how it's going to be architected. And as a result, I've been able to choose how it's going to map to Sakoda's architecture. I'm uh, bringing in the bucket name and I'm actually pulling that and only grabbing the content within that bucket. If you're familiar with Google Cloud, you know that they tend to refer to everything as blobs. Again, really unstructured data. We set the, the tone of it. And so that's why we need to make this custom integration for this setup. Of course, there are many other reasons you might want to do a custom integration, but that lack of opinionated, opinionated um, lake for our data, this allows us to make it work for our specific use case. So. 
As I go through the blobs, high level, what we're seeing here in this for loop is I'm declaring my database, I'm declaring my schema, I'm declaring my tables, I'm declaring the lineage in the tables, and then I'm declaring my columns. Now, because the blob doesn't really tell you this is a folder um, or this is a higher level folder or this is a nested folder, I have to get creative in how I'm determining that. So that's what all this is. I'm essentially just using the uh, blob strings to determine what everything is. You know, if it's a one-parter, it's a database. If it's a two-parter, it's a schema. If it's a three-parter, it's the actual final file that we're translating to a table. Um, the other thing I know about my lineage is that the name of the table, the pattern for the name of the table in BigQuery is the exact same as the name of the CSV file. That makes it easy for me to map that lineage. Um, of course, though, that might be different depending on your use case. So I do recommend just getting ahead of that and determining what the pattern is or if it has to be hard coded, if there's like a mapping that you need to do. All right. So now we're getting into those declarations. So this is what a declare resource uh, looks like, function looks like. And this is the resource model here. So there's a lot of, um, clearly it's not connecting to my Sakota DK locally right now, but of course no demo is gonna go perfectly. But there are a lot of fields um, that can be extracted from the resource or set, sorry, on the resource. Uh, those fields correspond to that metadata that we spoke about earlier. Specifically here for my database, I'm not really that interested in too much metadata. So I want to make sure that there's a title on it. I want to make sure that the entity type is set to database. Again, the entity type maps to the Sakota architecture. But for me, it's a folder and I want that clear in the UI as well. So I'm calling it native type folder. And then I'm setting a data builder ID. At Sakota, the data builder ID is the unique ID of your um, of your resource. So it's not necessarily a numeric ID. What we tend to follow the pattern of is going from integration dot database name dot schema name dot table or some variation of that. Uh, I recommend within your integration to be opinionated about how you're building your data builder ID and keep that pattern consistent throughout all of your different uh, resources. That's going to help for future referencing. It's going to help if there are other tools that are referencing the custom integration. Um, if you know how you know their database and schema information is returned, then we can also build lineage to your custom integration if we see that mapping. Data builder ID, very important. We're happy to work with our customers to determine the best pattern for it. So here we are declaring the resource for our database. Similarly for our schema, you can see here, I'm just extending the data builder ID. So I've got the bucket name, which is the integration, the name of the database, and then the name of the schema here. Same thing now, native type, entity type. The one thing I've done is I've set the database on the schema so that it's clear who, uh, what owns what, you know, what is our hierarchy. Uh, and the database name is up here, right? It's we're still in the same loop. So it's the part zero when I get creative around how I'm breaking up the content from the blobs. Now we get into tables. Now this gets a little bit more interesting because we're not just declaring the table in this loop. We're declaring a table, we're declaring lineage, and then we're declaring the columns from that table. So when we get into the table, we want, this is our creative way, making sure that the names are properly set up. But I'm adding a few other pieces of metadata. I add the database and the schema, the data builder ID, but I've also gone ahead and added a description that's going to be brought into Sakoda. And so we see that description here, CSV data from pop-up sales can be found. And then I add the public URL of um, this CSV and that's just available on the blob. So the blob returns that and I can take advantage of it and throw it into my description so that I have that when it gets uh, brought into Sakoda. I have some context already baked in. Now what I'm doing here is I'm actually declaring lineage between this table, which is over here, and an external table, which I know already exists in Sakoda, um, and it is in BigQuery. And so what I, what I did was I went into Sakoda and I determined, okay, what is the database name? What is the schema? What is the table for what I'm trying to map it to? And all of the database, all of the tables I want to map to are in a database called Sakota Web. Um, technically, that's the project name, but the way that that was mapped in Sakota is to database. So I can set it up as Sakota Web as the database. 
The schema is uh, the bucket name. That's what I've realized, but I've just called it a data set here. So it's the bucket name. And the table is actually the same as the table name I've given here. So makes for some really, really easy mapping. Of course, not all lineage is going to be like that. So there might be extra you know, things that you have to do here, extra logic. Maybe you have a SQL query instead that you want um, to be resolved that you can use. And that goes back to that original presentation where I was showing the slides, the four different lineage models that we have that you can work with. Pretty much when you're declaring lineage, you are declaring the from and the to using lineage objects. And the lineage object could be either an internal resource, an external table, external column, or custom SQL table, um, which is what I showed earlier in those slides. So here I am declaring the lineage, creating that from and to, um, and that is our second step of tables. And our last step of tables is actually going ahead and declaring the columns. So some little code here to go ahead and grab that CSV and dump the context of it. Uh, after I do that, I determine what the header is because that header is now going to be my column values. And then I loop through the column values to make sure that each column has a title, an entity type, again, that native type with the field. Um, so I'm calling those columns fields, but in Sakota, um, the architecture maps to a column. I've set the database, the schema, the table. I've set a parent. So the parent here is the table. And the reason that's important is because a column can belong to a table, but its parent can be another column, right? We can have that nested column structure. So just in case I have nested columns, I want to make sure that my parent data builder ID is declared here. So it knows, actually, no, there, it's not a nested column. The parent of this column is actually the table. So it is just belonging to the table. And then, of course, the data builder ID. So all the fields that we're familiar with, I could add a description here. I could also add, for instance, what we often see on column level um, uh, metadata is a data type. Um, I actually think on column, it ends up being just type. And that could be something like an integer or a float or anything like that. I can't pull that information right now from my CSV or I just haven't looked into it. So I'm not declaring it programmatically. Um, but I can show you that in Sakota afterwards, we'll be able to map this table to its big query where there has been a determination of um, the types. And we could even in the future set up column level lineage to uh, see that direct connection. So maybe in the CSV, there isn't a strict type, but once it gets into BigQuery, we do end up being opinionated about it. We add that structure and we can now map that all together. Okay, so that was a lot. That was a lot of coding, but what did we do here? Well, we authenticated. Then we went through all of our resources in our source and we declared the database, the schema, the table, the lineage between tables and the columns. Uh, and what else we could do here is we could declare more lineage, we could declare column level lineage, uh, we could add more metadata to any of our resources. There's really an endless amount of things that we could do, but what's important to know is that it's doable. It's doable and we're here to help you get there. Okay, so you've written your code, what do you do next? Well, now that you've written your code, you wanna bring it into Sakota. So I have here my integrations. I'm a cool brand. Um, I don't know if anyone can see that. So let me just zoom in. Actually, let me make this full screen. Um, I'm cool brand over here um, because I do not have any creativity when it comes to naming things. And you can see my integrations here. Now I've already integrated the Google Cloud Storage, but I'm gonna take you one step back so that we can walk through that together. So you go to integrations and you want to say when it's a create or connect integration. And that's where you'll see this fun button called create. When I click create, you would click create integration if it was the first time, but I already have one here. Uh, but I can take you through the flow either way. So here what you would do is you would set the icon for your integration and a name. You would determine what category it sits in so that it's easier to search for it when you're looking at the integration page and you would set up a description. So I have, uh, here we go, GCS icon, cool, GCS2, because I already have one, so I'm gonna try not to get confused, um, and set a description from pop-up data. 
Next, I'm asked to bring in my Python code. So I'm going to add the file. Uh, it is right here. And there we have it. We can view it if you want, but it's all there for me and I can throw it out as well, but I don't want to do that. I'm not ready. And I click next. Now, remember that credentials piece where it was taking it from the form? Here is where you set your form. The name that you want to put here is exactly what you have in your code. So in my code, I have um, JSON file, JSON underscore file. So in here, in my Safari, which I now, or in my Chrome, which I now cannot find um, because I made it full screen. There we go. I'm going to go JSON underscore underscore file. Now we do some front end magic so that it doesn't look like that when it's actually in the form. And I'll show you that um, shortly. But this way, the form knows exactly what to look for in your code in order to determine what the value it needs to look for is. Uh, now you can mark it as required. You can mark it as sensitive. Sensitive means that it will be uh, encrypted and it will also be um, asterisks all the way through. So it's not visible to the end user when they're inputting it. Uh, then you want to add your allowed endpoints. So if you're hitting any API endpoints, you want to add that here. Uh, if you are not hitting any endpoints and you're using packages, you will have to chat with us and we'll have to figure that out together. It is possible, but again, for security reasons, we just want to be careful of it. So if you are using endpoints, that's where you would throw it in here. You see some examples here of we did like a, a Cluvio um, sample. So here we would do there. Uh, if I was using a direct, a direct endpoint to Google Cloud, I might go like, I forget what it is, Google storage dot whatever with my uh, appropriate um, suffix at the end of that URL. But yes, any endpoint that you hit, you want to allow it here. I'm not using any endpoints because I am going almost directly through, uh, entirely through the package. So I'm just removing any endpoints and clicking create integration. Now, earlier you saw Lindsay show a screen of our marketplace. If you want to bring this into the marketplace, you can submit for a review um, and that will end up notifying our team and we'll work with you to make sure that it's good and ready to be shared with the community because ultimately that's what we want. We want a community driven effort on getting as many integrations into uh, into Sakota as possible. If you get uh, if you decide to make some big version changes, you can actually create a new version here. You can go back and edit it. There's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, if you decide there's a new input you want to add or a new endpoint, you can add it there. Um, all of that is available for you. And now I have these two integrations. Um, this one I'm not using. That was just for sample. But you can imagine I'm using this one, right? And I have all the information there. And I can actually click Connect. And that's what will make this a new integration on my integrations page. So when I go to browse, now that I have that integration, I can search for it. Oh, look at that. The new one's there too, GCS2, but this is the one that I was going for. I can click connect on it and I would be I would navigate to a screen that looks familiar. I made JSON file, bucket name, and Teams. Teams is just default. And you can also choose uh, if you have several versions, what version of the code you want to be used. I've already set this up. So here's my Google Cloud Storage. You can see it's in the general team. I have the connection here. I've submitted it. I have my bucket name. My sync history has completed. Once it's completed, I can see that there were three tables, 20 columns, six schemas, and two databases. Um, so that looks just about right. I actually should double check what I have. That's good discoverability because I thought I had only created one database. Turns out I've created two. That's good to know. Maybe something I wouldn't have otherwise known if I didn't bring it into Sakota. But it does give you that really, really good summary. Okay, so now I can go into my catalog and I can see all of this working together. So my catalog will show me everything from all my integrations, but I can go ahead and filter for Google Cloud Storage. Uh, and then let's just look at the CSVs. And there we go. I can see all of the CSVs that were in my Google Cloud. And when I click on them, I can see well, the type is missing, which I spoke about because CSVs, I couldn't grab the type. I didn't take the time to look at that. But when I look at my lineage, I can see, oh, this actually goes to a table in BigQuery. Um, and from there, let's say that BigQuery table was used to develop more dashboards or go into other tables. Now I have a much 
bigger picture around my data. And of course, with this table over here, I can add tags. There's my description from earlier. Um, I can do governance, verification. I can add related resources. There's a lot that I can do to add context to my data, um, but you can't do it if it's not in Sakota. So what we're doing here is getting the data into Sakota so that you can add context. Okay. We've gone through the entire loop here of things that we can do with the SDK. Um, this is the documentation. Their models are all there. The fields are there publishing to the marketplace. But I want to stop and see if anyone has any questions. Um, maybe, Lindsay, if you have any questions. And if not, we'll just do some key takeaways and uh, talk a bit more about what else Dakota can do for you. That was awesome, Brett. Thanks so much for taking us through all of that. And yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it speaks for itself. It's pretty amazing that you can bring all that in and, and map all of your uh, rogue data sources, if you will. Um, so thanks for taking us through everything. I don't have any questions. I don't see any questions in the chat, but if folks are listening in, feel free to, to drop any questions you have for Brett in here. Otherwise, maybe we can kind of just touch on key takeaways and then we could wrap things up if there's no questions. Sounds good. I do feel like I've been talking for a long time. That's so. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Oh, well, I hope uh, whoever is watching, if you guys, uh, or if you're watching after the fact that this is helpful, if not, do reach out to us. Uh, that's our number one key takeaway. If you're stuck, check out our docs, give us a shout. Um, we're here to partner with you. We want everyone to have as seamless of an experience as possible to build these integrations um, and to share them with the community. So if you are stuck, we are happy, happy, happy to help um, and work together to achieve that goal. Uh, now, if you're watching this and you're like, that was a lot, I have never opened VS Code, I have no idea what a S software development kit, let alone a Sakota development kit uh, is, that's okay. We do have other ways of uploading data or uploading resources um, for Sakota. So they don't, the, the difference with the other methods is that we don't run them on a schedule. So they're upload methods. You would have to upload every time um, you want to update the information. But we do offer CSV uploads or JSON-L uploads, which are essentially just files um, with JSON objects. And you can use those to also bring in um, integration resources. You can use those to declare lineage. A lot of the same things that we can do with the SDK. Uh, a little less flexibility, of course. And like I said, it is more manual because you do have to upload it yourself. Um, but those options are available for you. And of course, we have our APIs as well. Uh, all of this is documented. So please read the documentation, ask us questions. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Uh, and the last thing is, we keep saying it, but this industry is a community. Um, like I said at the start here, I've only been in data for you know just over a year, but the community feel is very, very, very present. So help us help you help the community and uh, submit your integrations to the marketplace if you think that other folks will be interested in using it. Uh, we'll try and get back to you quickly and we'll work with you. Like I said, we'll partner with you to make sure that integration is you know, working well for all other folks that may want to use it. Overall, there's a theme here. Ask us questions, try it out, and let's make this work together. That's what we're all about here. And I'm really excited um, about this piece of technology and how it will allow us to bring the community together even more. Um, that's it for our key takeaways. Are we, uh, oh, we got, we got some, some questions, but they're not questions. They're just, just, qu just shout outs. Yeah. I think you nailed it, Britt. You did a great job and thanks for everyone for listening. And yeah, like Britt said, feel free to reach out. If you try this on your own and you're stuck on anything, give us a shout. Uh, this is now a video asset you can come back to at any point. So you can always come back and watch Britt go through this again if you need to. And yeah, thanks so much, Britt. That was awesome. Thank you, Lindsay, and thank you everyone for watching. Reach out to us if you end up giving this a try. Really excited to work with you all. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone.